You have a very good memory, I'm told. Like really, almost a photographic memory of stuff. Do you remember the day of the murder very acutely? Is it a very vivid memory? I remember impressions more than I do vivid memories. It's not, it's not like there's a film in my head that I can just play whenever I want to. That's really all I can say about it. There are parts that are very, very clear and there are parts that are hard, hard to remember. All right, Chase, what do you got? So uh, in my notes, it says he goes down to internal dialogue where there should be severe emotion in most people until you realize this video is reversed. It's backwards. So that little mole under his left eye is actually under his right eye. So when you're seeing him go into down, uh, down left, that's down right. So that is actually emotional accessing. If you type his name on a Google images, you'll see that mole is directly under his right eye. So when kids are around 12, there's a slowdown in something that we call synaptogenesis. And this is just a fancy way of saying that the, the brain's neurons aren't linking up as quickly as before. And this can cause a few bumps in the road, I think, for a brain that's still growing, especially in the frontal lobe. So now if psychopathy is also here, things get uh, a little more complicated. You've got an underdeveloped frontal lobe, then there's the amygdala and this other thing called the insula, uh, which are smaller than usual, both of those in most psychopaths. So the amygdala is kind of tucked away super deep in the temporal lobe. It's kind of like our emotional control center, and it's kind of how we react to social stuff. And then there's the insula that's inside the cerebral cortex. It's like our body's kind of emotional weather station. It helps us to feel things like love and anger and fear and anxiety. So when these areas aren't fully developed, or are smaller than usual in a developing brain like this, it can really contribute to a perfect storm uh, leading to a spike in violent behavior, potentially. But in the video, we're seeing half blinks. I want you to pay attention to that when the video comes back up. The, the eyelid doesn't close all the way, and this is target lock behavior. This is the body, not him consciously thinking this, this is the body wanting to keep the target in view as much as possible. That's why the eye is not closing all the way. And right when he says it's hard to remember, there's contempt at the end of this. There's contempt on his face. Contempt at just saying hard to remember. I just, just take that and think about the personality behind somebody who would be contemptuous while they were saying oh, it's hard to remember. And they show that contempt on their face. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, agree with you. And one of the things that's interesting here is if you want to know what limbic thought looks like, what a person who has gone and done something rage filled or whatever kind of crazy you want to know, and they're trying to remember it, all you have to do is try to remember your last automobile accident or something that happened to you that was stressful and turned off your thinking brain. What he's describing here is exactly that. He's describing this thing happened. Yeah, I did it. I can't remember exactly the order things went in. And Chase, it's appropriate that he would be probably over in the emotional, regardless whether he has any feelings for the person or not, there's probably emotion associated with the fact I can't remember, boom, boom, boom. And he goes to a slower cadence. We usually associate that slower cadence and loss of fluency with being out of the thinking brain. Whereas if you're over here, you're going to go to slower cadence and be more methodical in your process as you're halting and you're working through it. it this is him trying to recall this, and I really do believe he can't remember the order things went in, and he's trying to explain that loss. That's all I got. Uh, uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so really interesting. You notice that uh, mirror reversal there because it's okay. not the only shot that it happens in, but not all of the shots are reversed. So there's a choice happening here. Uh, let's look at the analysts. The analysts in this video, which is different from other videos, and also they'll do the same, the, the two different shots in, in one scene, the analysts are reversed. If you look at the Sony logo, it's backwards. Now, if you if you put two rever um, uh, mirrored shots in one scene, it's very disconcerting for an audience, but the audience won't quite know why. So either you're doing it to be disconcerting, 
or either you're doing it because you wish you'd bought more cameras and you're trying to create the idea of of more angles and, and up the production value. Well, given that, given that, so which one is it? Which one is it? Um, so given that he says, I remember, and he really slows down for that bit, they've caught a lovely bit of that. And then we go to a shot of a foggy street and a street lamp and the camera panning up the road towards the door. That's the exorcist. So go and look at the exorcist uh, um, poster and you'll see the same image used by, by, by William Friedkin, who was copying Fritz Lang, the uh, German expressionist. Uh, they are clearly playing immediately into the one, one of the classics of the supernatural horror genre immediately. I I remember, um, and then he says, he says, uh, it's not a film in my head. While they're playing classic images from one of the most horrifying films ever made. Uh, so, you know, interesting what they're doing there of, of we've had this setup of 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 hot flaming ball of wrath in the pit of my stomach and now we're going to some classic images from uh the classics of of horror so i can kind of see the way they're wanting to push us on this towards the idea which which the exorcist put forward which was there is such a thing as evil it actually exists there is no psychological way to explain this it's a it's a supernatural um um uh causation scott what have you got yeah i agree with you trying to make this look really scary on the outside on the inside watch them is pretty scary yeah when you had the, all the other stuff the the dark and all that yeah you're right that's that's really scary i could add a bunch of stuff that would um, to be around your guys stuff orbiting it really small so I'll keep this short because I everybody's nailed pretty much what I got but um what I'm seeing is again the same flat effect nothing really happening outside of what happens with the psychopath I'm still uh, it's as enlightening because we're seeing things that psychopaths don't do you guys were talking about the emotional things he must be going through as he's doing this which those shouldn't come into play. So that's that's the part that's for me a little bumping up against what we all what we know as as a true clinical psychopath, which I think this what this guy is. So let's see what happens next. One of those tape replays. You have a very good memory, I'm told. Like really almost a photographic memory of stuff. Do you remember the day of the murder very acutely? Is it a very vivid memory? I remember impressions more than I do vivid memories. It's not, it's not like there's a film in my head that I can just play whenever I want to. That's, that's really all I can say about it. There are parts that are very, very clear and there are parts that are hard, hard to remember. If you like this video, get the full body language breakdown and analysis on our main channel by clicking this video right here.